a warm welcome uh, to all of you who have joined us today for this important seminar of emerging security sector leaders in Africa under the theme leadership in times of uncertainty. My name is Luca Byung-Denkwal. I am the Dean of Academic Affairs at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and the faculty lead of this program on emerging security sector leaders in Africa. This session three is part of the four sessions of this seminar. And this session will be under the theme of responding to unexpected security challenges and crisis. But before we can start again our dis discussion and conversation, let me share with you uh, some of the key takeaway from, from the previous uh, session. The previous session was focusing on how to examine leaders and, and, and institution anticipating security challenges and crisis, and to assess the role of national security strategy in developing foresight and proactive forward-looking capabilities to anticipate security challenges and crisis in Africa. The first key takeaway is about leadership and organizational culture in Africa. One of the key principles of adaptive leadership is stress testing of key underlying theories, assumptions, and belief. As leaders and institutions often operate with assumption and belief that tomorrow will be the same as today or even yesterday. While we are aware that we are, we are living in the world that is changing with a lot of uncertainty. Addictor Muhari questioned this assumption in the case of African leaders and institutions such as African Union and emphasized the predatory nature of African leaders that may inhibit adaptive leadership to anticipate and proactively respond to security challenges and crises. And this is actually highlighted in the early warning system of the African Union. So anticipating and responding to security challenges and crises need a change in leadership culture from reactive and traditional response to a more proactive response with a foresight approach. The second key takeaway is about the foresight capabilities. One of the characteristics of adaptive leadership is the foresight approach that is informed by credible early warning system. There are some foresight capacities in Africa, such as the African Union Continental Early Warning System, and some of the think tanks such as Institute of Security Studies. Yet the information being generated from this early warning system are not often acted upon as the decision makers and leaders do not prioritize early response above political interests. The third key takeaway is the role of the national security strategy in anticipating uh, crisis and challenges in Africa. The process of developing national security strategy provides opportunity, not only in assessing and anticipating security challenges and opportunities, but also in developing inclusive and, inclusive and centralized foresight capabilities that are guided by a proactive forward-looking approach. The current foresight capabilities in Africa are either non-existent, and if they exist, they are decentralized, not rigorous and systematic, and do not include different national security uh, stakeholders. For example, the Boston Consulting Group as in the article on adaptive leadership, they develop a scenario planning to respond to, to COVID-19 and advocates the establishment of integrated model of anticipation, intelligence, and response that can develop different scenarios to support decision-making in times of uncertainty. Such a model is so relevant not only at national, uh, national level, but also at the regional and continental level, but indeed also at the local level. And the last key takeaway is a local and community foresight and responsibility and response capability. 
while focus is on the developing continental, regional, and national foresight and response capabilities, having cyber capabilities at local and community level is essential for effective and meaningful response. So these are some of the key takeaways uh, from, the, uh, from the previous session. Let me now share with you what we want to achieve from this session three. And as I mentioned, this session will be focusing on responding to unexpected security challenges and crises in Africa. And so before introducing, so, it's made, so we have about three objectives. One is to examine the importance of partnership and collective action in mobilizing and coordinating response to these security challenges and crises. Uh, second is to share lessons from Ebola and COVID-19, as well as more traditional security challenges, such as the, the exponential rise of violent extremism, transnational organized crime, and climate change, for leaders to, to leverage to, to leverage for partnership and to improve coordination in response to unexpected security threat and crisis. And the last objective is to discuss why some countries and region have been successful than others in leveraging, in, uh, in, in responding to these uh, uh, challenges. Let me now introduce the, uh, the, the panelists. I am pleased to, to welcome two outstanding and seasoned experts on security in Africa. And, and how they will be able to discuss to converse the conversation with them about responding to security challenges and crisis in Africa. As you have the bios, I will highlight some of the relevant aspects of their expertise and qualification. Let me start first, and we are so honored having Lieutenant General uh, Bram Diop. Um, he is the military advisor in the Department of Peace Operations at the United Nations. Uh, he's a family member of the Africa Center. And, and as he served for many years with the Africa Center as a facilitator and a speaker in a wide range of seminars. He served as the chief of defense staff of the Singhalese Armed Forces. Uh, he also served previously as national security advisor to the president of Senegal and the chief of staff and deputy chief of staff of the Senegalese Air Force. He studied in many academic institutions, including the Royal Air Academy of Morocco, the University of Southern California, the Air University in US and the College of Inter Army of Paris. He was a fellow at the National Endowment and Democracy in US, and he published several articles on its strategic, on its strategic airlift capacities, security sector reform, and civil military relations in sub-Saharan Africa. He's a PhD candidate at the Center for Diplomatic and Security Studies in Dakar, Senegal. So I'm extremely honored, uh, Dr. Diop, for joining us today, and I am sure the participants will benefit a great deal from your wealth of experience. Thank you very much for joining us. The second uh, panelist is Dr. Feli Shepi. She is an independent expert in conflict and security, and she actually reviewed the Africa Center National Security Strategy Development Toolkit. She is a roasted expert for the International Security Advisor, Sector Advisor, Advisory Team, and she worked at the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance a well leading center in security governance. She holds master from the Geneva Graduate Institute and a doctorate from the Otter Soha Institute of Political Science in Berlin. Uh, we are extremely delighted, uh, Dr. Feli, for joining us today. Let me start now my conversation. First, I want to start with General Duke. And really within five to six minutes, I would really like you to share with us, based on your experience and your own perspective, what do you think are the most critical security challenges likely to face Senegal and West Africa in particular in the next five to 10 years and why? 
And do you feel that the government or ECOWAS are adequately prepared and equipped uh, to respond to these challenges in terms of leadership, strategy, or institutions? And, and why or why not? Please, you are most welcome, Jero Diop. Thank you very much, Luca. Thank you very much to ACSS for inviting me. As you said, I have been working with you guys for almost 22 years. And it is always with pleasure that I say yes to your invitation and that I come and share the little I know about the themes you are discussing. I have told you one day that Luca, if I knew what were the real challenges Senegal were facing and the West African region were facing, I would be very rich because it's very difficult to anticipate the challenges. Military personnel are generally working on contingency planning because the deliberate planning they are formulating in general will not match when crises surge the reality of the ground. And we used to say that the plan is the first victim of the battleground. So please, for those who are getting ready to take responsibilities in the future, get ready to be working most of the time on contingency planning because generally, the threats are unexpected. But based on what we have seen taking place on the ground recently in Senegal and in West Africa, we can legitimately say that Senegal should be preoccupied by violent extremism. Given the situation in the region, particularly in countries that are our neighbors, and given the last development we have seen on the ground from one of the major actors in this fight, Senegal should take more seriously the threat related to violent extremism and terrorism. And I do think that the leaders in my country are well aware of the threat and are taking the necessary measures that will help us face in case of, uh, of degradation of the situation. Apart from the violent extremism, I also think that based on the development we have seen recently, our country and many other countries in the subregion, unfortunately, can be facing civil unrest. As you know, in many of our countries, when we just want to change, the political leadership, we end up having hundreds or thousands of casualties. You know also that in our countries, the youth bulge is a reality. Our population is very young. Many statistics are talking about 75% of our population composed of young people between the age of 16 and 35. And the same statistics are saying that 70% of those 75% are not active. But worst, they even don't have one single hope to be active one day. So this is a very timely bomb we have in our hands. I think for the case of Senegal also, we should be looking west because of the next exploitation of the oil and gas. As you know, in most of African countries, whenever you have the state engaged in exploiting oil and gas, the bad guys manage to be there to create a parallel system, a black market to take the part of the puzzle, of the cake. And I don't see Senegal being an exception to that. So we need to get ready 
to counter this kind of bad activities that can be undertaken by the bad guys. I will also add, it's not the case of Senegal, but in West Africa, we are witnessing more and more confrontation between agriculturists and cattle ranchers, cattle breeders. This is also a source of insecurity in West Africa. The last one has to do with the advancement of the desert, which is generally about four to six kilometers south every year. And we are already feeling the consequences of this advancement related to very often um, locust invasion, as we have witnessed in Senegal and in Mauritania not a long time ago, and also floods every year in Senegal and in many other countries with a lot of casualties. So we need also to get ready with natural catastrophes related to this climate change. Those I think are the main preoccupations we should be keeping in mind in the next five, 10 years in West Africa and in Senegal. The good news is that based on what I hear the responsible saying, they are well aware of this risk and are taking the necessary measures to confront these challenges when time will come. It's never perfect, but I'm sure that at this, for the case of Senegal, the necessary measures are being taken. Thank you very much. Well, well thank you very much, Joel, uh, for being precise and articulating these uh, the security challenges uh, in the future for the Senegal and the West Africa. My second question is really to, is based on your, uh, the role as she, uh, previous role as chief of journalist, staff, chief of, of, of defense staff and the national security advisor. Uh, what are the key leadership skills that you find yourself using most when confronting with such uh, security challenges or un unexpected security challenges? And please share with the participants your insight on how some of these principles of uh, adaptive leadership uh, may help them to respond effectively to these security challenges and crises as you narrated in, uh, in the first question. Thank you uh, very much. As I told you earlier, based on this very small experience I have, I think we as leaders will be regularly facing unexpected challenges. So since we are facing more regularly unexpected challenges, plans, I'm not saying they're not relevant, but will not help us solve our problems. So to me, the major investment we should be doing should be on human being because those are the ones, whatever the situation in which you are, who will make the difference. But please do not wait until the situation is bad before investing in them. You should upstream invest in your people so that you create what I call a positive mentality. A positive mentality. You also trigger what we call self-confidence. These two are fundamental in the reaction and the behavior of your people. Positive mentality, self-confidence. Those are the number one criteria you need to fulfill 
for any success in whatever activity you undertake. So to have that, we need to have people who are motivated, committed, and also who are ready to own the responsibilities that are in their hands. But this does not fall from the sky. It requires an investment. That's why the working and living conditions of your people are key for you to have people who are really in a positive mentality and who are committed. Let us make sure that we put our people in good living and working conditions. It means that you care for them. You also need to make sure that you respect your people by listening to them. Because generally you are the supervisor or the chief just because you're older. When they will be at your age, they will be at the same position. So you need to respect them. You need also to listen to them and to include them in the decision-making process. If you do that, people will take whatever necessary measures to do the job. And you will not need to be always behind to push because they will own their responsibilities. You also need to make sure, and we don't do that very often in Africa. Let us appreciate what people do. When our people, they manage to do good things, we need to appreciate what they have done and reward them consequently. If they need to be promoted, why not not promoting them? If they need to be rewarded positively in public, why not to do that? But we focus very often on negative sanctions than on positive sanctions. We need to change this paradigm. And if you do that in general, people, when they are facing an unexpected situation, you will be amazed by their reaction. They will take the necessary measures and move forward and take care of the problem. I have experienced it. And I think that it is my responsibility, my duty to really encourage the next generation of African military leaders to go the same direction. It's about people, it's not about the leaders. Leaders are not there to talk every time about themselves or to want people to always focus on them. No, leaders are instruments put in place to make things happen. So the leaders should change of, change of center of gravity and have the center of gravi gravity focus on the people. If you do that, you will see concrete positive result on the ground. These are really the uh, advices based on a small experience I have. I can share with my nephews, my young brothers, and also my sons. I am talking to. Thank you very much. Oh, oh thank you very much, uh, uh, General. I think there's a very good um, way of trying to invest in people as a key weapon to respond to this unexpected crisis. I think investment investment in people, I think, is a key. I think that's very, very important. And then the whole aspect of uh, uh, interpersonal and behavior um, uh, uh, motivation of, 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 of individuals is quite key as well. Let me now move on based on your personal experience and the experience of Senegal in responding to COVID-19. Um, what has been the role of the security sector in this, in this response to the, uh, the COVID-19? And uh, do you see evidence of the key attributes of adaptive leadership whether in terms of anticipation or articulation or adaptation or accountability in the way Senegalese uh, responded to COVID-19. 
before I will uh, focus on the particular role the security sector has done, let me talk also about the response at the macro level, at the state level, that has also widely contributed to what is considered as a success for Senegal in its response to COVID-19. I think it needs to be highlighted. The fact that at the national level, the leaders have been very conscious in a very timely manner about the seriousness of the health crisis. That is key. We have not wasted time before being really conscious about the seriousness. It did not take too long for our leaders to, to get it, to feel that what we were heading to was very tricky. So we responded in a very timely manner, in my opinion. In addition to that, we also need to recognize that our leaders have taken very difficult decisions, bold and swift measures. I am referring to the curfew that was very unpopular, but very necessary, but also the state of emergency. Because as you know, many people in Senegal every day and we all have experienced this. Every day you need to get out of your house to go and find something to bring for your family. So if you ask people to not move from their house, to stay home while they have nothing in their pockets, it's a very unpopular decision, but we took it because it was about our survival. So bold and shift decision, very unpopular, but were taken also by the leadership. We have also, it never per, it's never perfect, but I think we have uh, conducted a kind of very satisfactory strategic communication policy. The communication is key. Educate people about the COVID. We did it. All the medias together have joined hands and have really sensitized the populations about the seriousness of the COVID and about also all the security measures they had to abide by for the uh, COVID to not propagate uh, in an uncontrolled manner. Uh, this particularly using the social media to reach out to people, I think was also extremely helpful. There was also a good coordination. As I say, it's never perfect, but a good coordination between interveners, between the major two stakeholders. I mean, the health ministry and the armed forces ministry. There was a very good coordination every day. There was a meeting, coordination meeting to assess the situation and take new measures, readapt, reorient. And this also have been very, very, very helpful. Senegal has decided during the COVID to let the health experts lead the response to COVID-19. This is also key because those are the ones who know what is going on. Those are the ones who can give the good advices. Those are the ones who can also uh, sensitize based on the expertise and their knowledge. And they have led the, the response. Now, the military, in addition to contributing to all these measures I have talked about, the military have made available all the health infrastructures. You know, Senegal has 
very good military hospitals in all regions, and they were made available to the populations. We also made available one third of the medicine doctors, say all military people, we made them available to the national response. And Senegal, once again, have benefited from the positive image the military have in the populations in general. The military is very well respected. Whenever they are involved in whatever activity at the national level, people have this very good tendency to trust what is being done because they see the military as part of the dynamic. And this is something that is very important. Whenever we deliver at the national level, when people see that the military are part of the process, they tend to trust. And this also has really helped. Those are really at the macro level, but also at the military level. The things we have done to make sure that COVID did not kill as many as it killed in other countries. And I'm not neglecting the hundreds of Senegalese who have lost their life. And I pray God to uh, welcome them in his paradise. But uh, compared to others, I think we cannot complain. Thank you very much. Oh, oh thank you very much. Um, um, uh, you maybe we'll come later on some of the attributes of leadership, adaptive leadership that you you see quite relevant when responding to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the COVID nineteen. But let me give, let me ask you the last question. You know you have been engaging this process in Senegal of developing national security strategy. And, and based on your experience on, in, in terms of COVID-19, what are some of the lessons learned from the COVID that could inform the process of developing national security strategy in Senegal uh, to better adjust and proactively respond to the ongoing and future security challenges? I have learned uh, maybe two, two major lessons. The number one lesson I have learned, uh, actually to tell you the truth, is not new because in my previous studies, I have highlighted, emphasized the fact that in most sub-Saharan African countries, the threats have nothing to do with having one neighboring countries trying to invade our territory. Okay, while we are waiting, I think we can, we can continue with our conversation with, uh, with Dr. Feli. Uh, Dr. Feli, the, um, really we, you have a, a wealth of experience in security governance in, in Africa and, and also your work also in reviewing our uh, national security side development toolkit. Please can you share with the participant what makes for a more resilient, responsive security sector in effectively rising uh, to, the, uh, to the challenge of dynamic complex and, and emerging shocks to the security landscape. You are welcome, Editor Feli. Thank you, Dr. Luca. I hope you're hearing me okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah, what a shame we've lost the general. Actually, um, in answer to your question, uh, I will take up some of the points that he raised. A security sector is first and foremost, it's people, the people that are working inside uh, the security sector. And I think that the one of the key elements of making sure that the security sector is more resilient, more responsive, more nimble, better able to respond to these dynamic, complex, emergent shocks and challenges in the security landscape is to ensure that the security sector is highly professional, highly capable, highly competent and motivated in their work. And this across all of the security forces, um, 
for defense and internal security, but also all of the civilian ministries and, and agencies and institutions that are responsible for their management and their administration and their oversight. And one of the key ways of making sure that the security sector is really a, a professional, capable uh, part of government and state service delivery is through democratic accountability, through democratic governance, through good governance. That's part of what makes some principles of governance good, some better than others. Um, we have a habit of thinking about democratic control and democratic accountability of the security sector as a political principle, as a, a question of, of protection of rights, as a question of protection of democracy. And it is certainly all of those things, but sometimes we forget that having a system, a robust system for democratic accountability and control in place is actually a really effective measure for security, to make the security sector a more professional place to work, to ensure that the personnel who work for the security sector, who work for national security, who work in national defense and internal security have the skills they need, the resources they need to do the jobs that are assigned to them and to make sure that those jobs are really clearly defined. Um, and so in that way, uh, we can think about um, having a good system of democratic accountability is really useful for a rational allocation of resources and making sure that when these new threats emerge, that the right capabilities are in place to be able to respond to them. It's also a great system for making sure that things that were supposed to be done actually do get done. And if they're not done, finding out what the problem is and fixing it. And those are elements that, that also enable security sector to perform better when the new, new challenges arise. It's also a way of looking for improvements, oversight and control and evaluation and following up on what resources were assigned to a certain goal, whether or not that task was performed and the quality with which it was performed is a way of also looking to improve. And as the security sector constantly creates systems which can improve its performance, that enhances its professionalism, becomes more competent and more capable, and that improves then responses to these threats, which is just what's required when the world is so unpredictable. And also, it's a way of ensuring that there is a long-term approach because the system is, or if it's working well, an effective democratic system or an effective system for democratic control is not designed to protect specific political interests or even personal interests. And so it can continue to function even when an individual or a particular stakeholder falters or falls away or, or faces problems. So it, it's a systemic -ish approach that allows for a long-term view of security, um, which then also helps the security sector better orientate itself to emerging challenges. Oh, oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Feli. Um, I think based bill on that one is to move in for the, um, um, I think this issue of um, democratic governance and and the um, and, and accountability is quite important. And then investing in people within the security sector is quite important to make this um, uh, security sector be resilient and prepared to respond to these security challenges. And, Linked to that one is the role of the national security strategy. To what level do you think such a strategy can help security sector leaders and government to have a better way of anticipating and respond to these complex security challenges? Um, and especially for the, un we have, do have not been well foreseen. Yeah, um, well, really, the national security strategy development process is the key process by which the security sector can come together and do its thinking about how to position itself, how to observe the environment, the strategic environment wherein it finds itself, how to then focus on specific priorities and capabilities that are the right response for that how then to allocate resources to those tasks and then to follow up and monitor and ensure that those things get done and to be accountable then for the quality of performance. Um, in that sense, the national security strategy is really helpful because as an overarching uh, document, as an overarching approach, it then allows each part of the security sector to understand its own role in orientating itself to those responses to challenges 
and then to take the action that's required. As the, as the, I think you've you've all um, been given the reference to the NSSD toolkit in your in your reading, and there uh, there are some elements in the process that are defined that are especially relevant for this when it comes to responding to to emergent threats. So one part of this is the threat assessment. Creating a good national security strategy really requires a careful process whereby the relevant parts of the security sector go through the process of examining the strategic environment based on all the information available and coming up with an assessment of what are the most relevant and direct threats to all of this. That may seem obvious, but it's actually a step that is often missed, especially when um, you think about the fact that most African uh, security sectors don't actually have national security strategies. So therefore there may not be a framework in place for systematically going through this process, thinking systematically about what the threat environment is looking like, how it's changing and whether or not capabilities are really aligned to respond to those emergent threats. Um, and also coming to an agreement about what threats are and how to align with those and allocate um, resources and attention to those threats. If there isn't a sort of singular whole of government approach to national security strategy development, then you have perhaps one part of the security sector who sees it this way, you have another that sees it another way, perhaps they agree, perhaps they don't agree, but it's really a matter of coincidence or perhaps interpersonal relationships it's not very efficient and it won't it's not the best way to get to the best responses or the best state of preparedness for these kinds of challenges um, equally the nssd process is a really important moment for setting priorities because the tendency with national security is to see challenges everywhere challenges everywhere and then the list of resources required to respond to those challenges just gets longer and longer and longer. And so a national security strategy is a really helpful way of planning what resources are available to secure the defense of the nation and to secure national um, internal security, human security, and then allocating resources effectively for that. That also involves work around identifying the stakeholders who are the people within or the, the institutions within the security sector that are directly responsible for monitoring specific threats that have a specific role in responding to them. And does everybody know what their specific role is? Role confusion, overlapping jurisdictions, unclear divisions of labor, all create confusion and lead to ineffective responses. Um, when, when a crisis arises. And, and the general was able to share with us, I think that the example um, from the context of COVID of how this kind of emergent challenge, which has security dimensions, but also many other pub dimensions of public well-being, requires a really clear definition of who does what, whose job is what, given the missions um, that the different security institutions hold. So national security strategy development process is really a helpful way of having a broad and inclusive vision of security where everybody understands what their role is and can also see what might be coming towards them with that. Well, well thank you very much, uh, Dr. Feli. Just linked to that one is just to bring in the issue of a strategy and the qualities of adaptive leadership and how we can link them together. And, and, and for, for your own um, view, what do you see the key principle or the elements of adaptive leadership, whether in terms of anticipation or articulation or adaptation or accountability that could help to make national security such development an effective tool for preparing proactively for and responding effectively on ongoing and future security challenges? There's a lot to say about that, but I see the general has just rejoined us. Shall I continue with that question? Or no, you can yes, we are going to continue with that question, yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll come back. Yeah. yeah, great. We're sorry, we, I hope we hear the end of the other one. Um, yeah, so adaptive elements of adaptive leadership, this idea of anticipation, of articulation, of adaptation, of accountability, these are really useful principles that also intersect with principles of good governance. 
Um, but then the question is, how? what do you do about that? What does that mean, for example, in national security strategy development? And there was some really interesting points in this, in, in your syllabus and in your reading around this, um, where what are the principles of action that come with this? Um, and one of them, the, one of the implications is that adaptive management requires evidence-based learning. You have to have a clear sense of what is actually going on and whether or not the approaches that you're using are working in order to be able to understand what's the next best action to take. And that ties in directly with the part of the national security strategy development process where you're doing an, a, an assessment of the status quo. What are the current capabilities of different security sector institutions and how have they done in responding to threats as they were previously defined or as they're seen at the moment? That process of, of assessing current capabilities really reflects the same kind of commitment to evidence-based learning and adaptation that we see from an adaptive management approach. So in that, in that way, NSSD really helps um, the security sector to match its capabilities with the needs, the strategic security needs that have been identified. So it's a useful tool in that way. Another principle that comes out of adaptive management is stress testing. Um, are your assumptions the right ones? And if you take that kind of idea of stress testing and um, stress testing assumptions and translate those into security sector governance and national security strategy making, you what you have is the need for constant monitoring and evaluation for the purposes of learning. Now, evaluation is a word um, that scares people. Uh, people feel afraid of failure. People feel that they may be held um, to blame for things that were perhaps outside of their control. And this can feed into then cultures of leadership that resist accountability, that resist learning from mistakes, that resist revealing failures. And that is, um, the opposite of what an adaptive management approach would call for. Under an adaptive management approach, you want to be identifying these kinds of failures in systems, failures in approaches, failures in perhaps preparedness of personnel, or trainings or capabilities, and you want to use those as learning opportunities to again feed back into the process of evidence-based learning to improve the next strategy, to improve the next move that your, that your institution will make. Um, and in a healthy, and this, this goes again to the idea of democratic accountability and a system of healthy democratic governance, which is professional in its management of human resources and its management of its people, individuals, professionals within the security sector don't have to be afraid of count accountability, they don't have to be afraid of failure, and they don't have to be afraid of perhaps taking the fall for something that, that wasn't their fault. They can actually feel protected by these systems, motivated by these systems, because they know that they're constantly being called to do a better job and that there is recognition from the leadership of what is required in order for personnel to be able to perform according to the tasks they've been assigned. And a clear assignment of tasks, a clear division of labor is cardinal from the level of the individual up through every level of the bureaucracy and the administration and the chain of command to the level of mission for the institution. And that's also why um, one another principle of, of, of adaptive management is accountability. So using these failures, using errors as a way of learning. Um, and that feeds in very well with the idea of the assessment process inside a national security strategy making process. There's always a point where um, you're looking at how well has the security sector performed and what's, how can the strategy adapt to, to improve that performance moving forward? And similarly, one of the other um, aspects of, of adaptive management that, that comes from this is the idea of mobilizing collective action. Um, and national security strategy making is a really good way of mobilizing collective action in the security sector because it requires that you have an inclusive process for strategy making, for talking about the conversation of what is security, what should we be aiming for, what should the objectives be. 
Um, and so on the one hand, that involves a broad conversation across the entire security sector, which needs to include all of the stakeholders in this human security vision, but then also a vertical conversation that involves the public and involves um, consulting beyond government, beyond the security sector to include the, um, the population in the vision of human security that you're aiming for. And as we heard from the general just before he was cut off, this role of public confidence in the security sector, the idea that the population understands what the security sector is trying to aim for and has confidence in their ability to do it is really enhanced directly by this kind of consultative NSSD process, which reflects the commitment to mobilizing collective action that uh, is also a cardinal principle of um, adaptive management. And then just the last point, um, which I think is a really important one, is that adaptive management really helps streamline decision making. And NSSD is a really good way of doing this. It needs to be really clear to everyone within the strategy making process itself of who is doing what part of the work. And then across the security sector, what is the division of labor? What are the roles and missions of each part of the security sector? Are they clearly defined? Are they well adapted? So that, that idea of streamlined decision making that comes from adaptive management really aligns really well with the idea that a national security strategy development process that is well made will make it clear to all stakeholders in the security sector what they're supposed to be doing. Oh, oh thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fairley. Maybe I will come up later on, maybe during the question and answer of this issue, and you, you brought it very well, the issue of, of accountability. Because in the middle of such crisis, responding, there's a possibility that sometimes you can erode the space for the rule of law and, 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 and accountability. And especially having a transparent decision making in responding to such crisis is extremely very important. Um, and I think that's why Yellen was talking about the issue of curfew and, 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 and instead of emergency are quite important to what level can you balance responding to this crisis at the same time you, you maintain the space for the basic rights of citizens uh, while you're doing. So we'll come to that one later. It's good that you brought up the issue of accountability. Uh, Yanwar, welcome back. We were, we were just at the, uh, the last question about the lessons learned from the COVID-19 in informing the national security threat development process in Senegal to be better at just and respond uh, effectively to the crisis. Uh, please, you are welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. I will go very quickly. Just saying that I was trying to explain how important it is nowadays for us to take into consideration the soft security aspect of what we're doing. Yes, we should not be naive in, by neglecting the hard security issue. We should prepare ourselves to counter any uh, temptation from anybody to come and aggress our countries. But in the meantime, we should focus also more and more on the internal human insecurity issues. So soft and hard. And while we are uh, trying to identify the security challenges, the security risk which, and threats, before developing the objectives, the, the means and the ways we should take into consideration the soft insecurity aspect of our insecurity matters nowadays. That's the number one lesson I have learned from COVID-19. It can be any time related to natural disaster or to health, or to politics, elections, I talked about it earlier, to food insecurity also. Sometimes community, the community of agriculturists confronting the community of uh, uh, cattle ranchers. All these are really new types of challenges we should be integrating in the development of our national security strategy. Now, in the ways we should also 
be more inclusive, more participatory, because the uniformed personnel alone cannot be dealing with those very delicate type of insecurity we are facing nowadays. And make sure that the media plays a role, the responsible role they should be playing in educating people on these issues. It's key. And for the media to have this responsible posture, we need to educate them prior to crisis for them to understand the role they have to play, the role they need to play in solving our insecurity problems. And finally, Luca, with all these very complex, ambiguous insecurity issues related to politics, related sometimes to religion, to the belonging sometimes of just an ethnic group, different ethnic group. It is impossible for those who are in uniform to be efficient if they don't maintain very good civil military relations with the population. This is the backbone of what we will be doing in the next decades. You cannot work for a population that does not trust you. You cannot work with a population that does not trust you. So we need to invest in building strong, reliable, and even complicit civil military relations for our societies to be more stable and set for development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuri uh, Diob and, and Andy Corfeli for such a quite informative uh, uh, conversation.